Oh yeah, oh yeah, the Eiffel Tower. So, you want to know how the Eiffel Tower was designed and built 130 years ago? Keep watching and I'll show you the engineering insights and tricks used to engineer this monster observation tower. But before I do that, let me give you some background on who I am. I am a professional engineer and I have designed and engineered many buildings in my career. Let's get into it. Millions of people have taken millions of photos in front of this monument, but most don't have a clue how this enormous 1,063 feet tall, 81 story structure came to be more than 130 years ago. You might think you probably already know everything about the Eiffel Tower, but we'll find out if I can surprise you with something you didn't know. And before we start, let's get through some of the basic facts first. The tower is named after its brainchild, the structural engineer Alexander Gustav Eiffel, who was a genius of his time, and his engineering construction company designed and built the Eiffel Tower, which later wears his name. However, you might not know that it was actually two lesser-known men, Maurice Couchelin and Emile Nugier, that worked for Gustav, and were the number crunchers that actually engineered and drew the original drawings back in 1889. Another key figure responsible for the design of the Eiffel Tower is the architect Stéphane Sylvester. The tower was supposed to amaze and show the achievement of the French people for the World's Fair in Paris that year in 1889. Kind of the same way how countries today show off their big stadiums for the Olympic Games. So in order to understand what inspired Gustave Eiffel to design the Eiffel Tower, we need to look at his other designs first, which were mostly numerous bridge structures in France and even the Statue of Liberty in New York. The inspiration for the Eiffel Tower's design is a bridge cut in the middle and placed back to back vertically to form a stiff vertical structure that can resist lateral wind loads. Similarly, a bridge can resist the vertical gravity loads when it lays flat. Re-envisioning a vertical bridge design was a really ingenious back in the 1880s and gained Gustav worldwide respect. Since Gustav Eiffel's company had a lot of experience in designing bridges and has perfected the mathematical relationships between the span and depth of the truss required to support the bridge loads, building it vertically was just another project for them. The secret sauce in the shape of the tower was the same mathematical relationship between the thickness of the structure required along the height to resist the lateral wind forces. At first, Eiffel Tower's purpose was controversial among the Parisian people because its large construction cost of 1.5 million at the time, which was more than 40 million in today's dollars adjusted for inflation. Also, labor rates were a lot lower back then, so it's still not a fair comparison. In fact, the Eiffel Tower is very similar in concept to some of the cheapest structures around today. Examples of those structures are the high voltage cable truss towers, which are cheap and fast to build in great heights. Similarly said, the Eiffel Tower is essentially a cable truss tower on steroids. To start, if we put ourselves in an engineer's shoes first, we need to start at the bottom of the tower first. At the bottom of the Eiffel Tower, what we find are the foundations, which is one of the most fascinating component of the tower that no one sees today, because it is simply underground. They are the main reason why the tower is still standing up straight even to this day. The foundations are massive and consist of four individual foundations at each quadrant when seen in plan from above. The foundations were one of the most complex at the time and required a large excavation and soil preparation to support the large weight of the tower. An added challenge to those foundations is that the two sides were built in close proximity to the banks of the Seine River in Paris, which made the process quite difficult. The foundation was installed on a sandbar compacted gravel layer located above a weaker clay layer which generally prevails in the Paris Basin soils. The tower is supported on four so-called legs that load the foundation at an incline. This was a unconventional at the time compared to typical buildings. A conventional building loads its foundation vertically downward, while the Eiffel Tower legs load the foundation at an incline which essentially pushes the foundation outward. This results in a large thrust outward in addition to the large downward force on the foundation from the weight of the tower. This is why the large column base plates had to be angled 
to resist the force normal to the large tower bands. The foundation is built on quarry stone masonry bases, also referred to as massifs. You see this type of quarry con stone construction in historic building foundations. Yeah, concrete was not yet established itself as the building material of choice back then. One of the main reasons why the Eiffel Tower's foundation needs to be so large and heavy is because you need a lot of dead weight to be able to create enough friction at the bottom of the foundation to resist large horizontal thrust from the bends. Gustav and his engineers realized that the most important thing is to balance the forces from the weight of the superstructure with the size of the foundation needed. That is where the number crunching really happens in engineering, to optimize the foundation designed to resist the weight of the tower. By the way, you can also see this similar technique being used in foundations of large bridge abutments that carry a large bridge force outward. So simple, but ingenious. And if this was not enough, another huge engineering consideration is that the large foundations needed to also be heavy enough to be able to anchor the tower to the ground for the large overturning from the lateral wind forces. I mean, tipping the tower under the Parisian breezes was not acceptable. You might ask, what wind are you talking about? There's no wind in the tower because it's made of these thin truss components that just wind can just blow through them and the structure is not affected. That is wrong because in fact those thousands of small components create quite a bit of wind drag when added over its entire height and could pick up a lot of wind force. So, before you fall asleep, let's move to the upper, more exciting superstructure of the tower. Believe it or not, the three main components responsible for making sure this monster of tower stands to this day are steel plate, steel angle, and a whole bunch of rivets. That's it. The four supporting legs of the Eiffel Tower each has four built-up leaning tube-shaped columns that are acting as the boundary elements of the larger truss columns. Those corner columns bends are made of built-up plate and angle and that are riveted together to form the large tube sections. The reason for these large tube sections is because the large compression forces at the corners of those bends. The tube-shaped column has a lot larger resistance from buckling under the heavy compression force from the weight of the tower. Those required a large tube section section that needed to be built up of steel plate and angle that were riveted in well-coordinated, sequenced fashion with the gusset plates for the truss components. Rivets were a lot more common way to connect steel in historic structures. Today we mostly use bolts and rivets are almost never used in modern structures. The tower's superstructure featured the intricate exposed truss lattice work that braces the corner tube shaped column elements together. There were also numerous decorative lattice work elements that had no structural purpose whatsoever, but were made just because they look good. A truss structure of this type is really efficient way to build up complex and lightweight shapes by optimizing the use of material and shape at the same time. Truss structures also provide a lot more rigidity, which was a logical choice for the structure of the Eiffel Tower. When I say rigidity, I mean that the tower sways a lot less from wind, which would be quite discomforting if you're standing on, on the top and you're drinking an espresso or drinking a glass of Bordeaux. Even today, most truss bridges use the same truss shapes to provide rigidity while at the same time being very lightweight. The lateral sway at the very top of the tower was estimated to be about two to three inches, which is quite decent, even by today's standards. The magic behind what holds the steel truss elements of the Eiffel Tower together are its connections. If those connections were to fail, then it would all just fall apart into little pieces like the Minnesota Bridge. That is why those are so important. The connections are primarily made using rivets, as we saw earlier. The way rivets work is pretty simple, but very effective. Rivets are heated to red hot and then fed through the bolt holes that are pre-drilled in the steel plate and then hammered in place from the opposite end. As the rivets cool off, they shrink and clamp the steel members together. This was a very common way to connect steel members in the 1900s. Nowadays, rivets are no longer a common way to connect steel structures due to the safety concerns associated with red hot steel being thrown on a job site. Therefore, pretension steel bolts are used instead. Another simplification that Gustav thought about is for the smaller member connections to be welded in a steel shop in order to reduce the riveting connections at the construction site. We now call this process prefabrication, which allows for more efficiency and faster construction because of the smaller number of field connections that need to be done. That is probably why the whole structure took only two years and two months to complete, which is 
quite remarkable even by today's standards. More than 18,000 parts were built in Eiffel's workshops in Livolis and assembled on site by 132 workers. Today, the Eiffel Tower has become a French icon and Mr. Eiffel's legacy that lives on and will continue to live on for decades to come. It is a marvel of structural engineering even by today's standards, with all the advances of technology available to our disposal. Today's 3D building modeling software and building techniques is so advanced, but the complexity of using all of this technology and the building regulations today could be stumbling blocks instead of aiding the building process. Even if someone had the opportunity to build such a marvel today, that might not be possible, because there are these moments in history when economics, regulation, and access to workforce converge to create one-of-a-kind structure that becomes icon for centuries such as the Great Pyramids of Egypt, the Colosseum in Rome, the Duomo in Florence and many more structures that have lasted for centuries. There are over 250 million people that have visited the Eiffel Tower and probably taken over a billion photos. One of the most photographed structures in Europe that has become one icon. The tower was the marvel of its time constructed to reach unseen heights at the time. A system assembled with steel, hard labor and sweat and some smart engineering and construction. The truth is that the history that is behind the Eiffel Tower and the staggering presence in its in center of Europe is what has made it so iconic. The tower survived World War I and then World War II and then the Nazi occupation of France and the invention of the automobile, fashion, electricity, the computer and so on. People of Paris have adopted the structure and made it part of their own life. And now tourists enjoy the Eiffel Tower's night show lights of the romantic Paris vibe. Subscribe to Glinra TV for more fascinating videos like this one.